The Symphony of Canterlot, Chapter 13, A War of Monsters Back into the present. You were able to identify my sister by the volume of magic you were sensing? It could have been just me sobbing by the fountain. Celestia said, probing me for additional details. Well, might as well not hold anything back. To be fair, your highness, it's because it was painful to follow that aura. Celestia raised an eyebrow at me. I figured that I should continue explaining. Your aura has been around us since Equestria was united a little over a thousand years ago. Even those with ethereal senses as sharp as mine are used to your presence. We've been with it since we were born, after all. Your younger sister, Luna. On the other hoof, she's been missing for over a thousand years. That is over ten generations without her around, and at that point, even our blood has forgotten how her aura feels. So, because of this, any with sharp ethereal senses within Canterlot is going to have to take, at minimum, an aspirin every morning to deal with her presence. In addition to that, her emotional breakdown caused an unscheduled change in the weather. Most would think that there's a mix-up in the local weather team schedule, and I, on the other hoof, could tell that it was something else merely by the fact that the magic was flooding the air felt much the same as the magic that was poking me at the back of my mind ever since I moved here. And, with my curiosity piqued, I just followed the flow of magic to its source. Celestia then did something interesting. I would have expected her to call me out on tracking down her family, but instead what I actually got was something quite... pleasant to my eyes. It was a smirk. I can see that Luna has... not lost her touch. She definitely still knows how to pick them. Celestia says with a slight air of relief and happiness before taking a small sip from her teacup. That left an interesting piece of inquiry. Who did she mean? Was she referring to the Knights of Ironclad by any chance? I actually didn't think that I would be worthy to be considered in the same vein as them back then. In fact, my exact thoughts at the time were, is this what flattery feels like? Maybe I was still asleep, and that was nothing but a sweet dream. As demented as that sounds to some now, flattery was something that I spent a better part of a couple years without hearing back then. So it felt nice. Now, Folklore, while that was interesting, you are avoiding the question. You told me how you found my sister, and I asked how you met her. Celestia said, and she was more curious now. And please, Folklore, don't skip on details. I need to know your thoughts on my sister. Celestia continued with a slight probing intent. Well... Alright, your highness. Can't say I didn't warn you, though. Naturally, she raised her eyebrow once more at that. The next afternoon after the encounter, Pages in Story's Bookshop, translated from Ancient Celtic. Last night I had given my overcoat to a really tall and obscenely magical powerful mare, I hadn't seen her face, but I heard her voice and it sounded like fine honey being served on a silver dish placed on a silk tablecloth. At the time, I was sitting behind the front desk reading a copy of that Canterlot Chronicler, basically just looking for anything that might have been odd, especially in the obituaries when all of a sudden, the front door opened and she entered. She trotted in like a lioness stalking a gazelle in the Zebrican Savannah. Her mane was like the clear midnight sky in the desert, with constellations and majesty that put even the star charts to shame, following on the unseen breeze of ether. She had legs for eons, and her figure was worthy of her title of goddess. Her eyes were a haunting turquoise that told stories of a thousand woes and triumphs, and her fur was a midnight blue that could one easily confuse for the void of the night sky. Her regalia was made out of the black casserite, and the crescent moon on her choker was made out of polished silver. She then turned to me, looking at me in such a way that I actually felt that she was sizing me up. It probably was, considering who we were talking about. It was just haunting how beautiful she was. Almost surreal. Who are you? I ended up spouting under my breath. I had to admit, at the time, no one had ever really taken a photograph of Princess Luna in any of the new news articles that featured her. So, in the end, I had no idea what she looked like. I could tell by the magic that she was emitting that she was divine in nature, though I couldn't place who she was for the life of me. Was she Selene? Maybe Artemis? No, not really. Both of those goddesses have been long dead in the old world. If either of them were in hiding before, the resurgence in the world would have been too large of a fiasco to hide. This was some pony new. Or, well, at least new to me. We 
have come to return what was loaned to us, she said flatly. She then materialized a coat out of thin air with a smoky residual of her aura trailing off of it, my black woolen overcoat. She then unceremoniously dropped it on my desk. Luckily, that brought me back to the land of the living. Your Majesty, I apologize for not recognizing you. I suspected that the ether outpour of the last couple of days was of your doing, but truth be told, I wasn't really sure. I have to say, in the descriptions that historians have written about you don't quite give you justice. I said with nervous haste. In truth, I was doing everything I could not to stutter. How so? If it be true, thee giveth us details about their mistakes describing our own complexion. Then, we can ask our own sister to revise the legitimacy of such descriptions. She said with genuine curiosity, uh, probably thinking that the records were so terribly written that they missed the mark. Being bold and probably suicidal, I decided to tell her the truth. I calmed down. I figure I would die with some pride. Oh, no need, your majesty. I'm just simply trying to say that a poet is a pony with far better aptitude to describe you than a scribe. I've never met a mare as beautiful as you. You are closer to a sublime force of nature made flesh than the maiden that the monks of Antioch depicted in their encounter with you. You would think that a bunch of isolated stallion sorcerers would practically worship you and start performing blood sacrifices in your name just to keep you in their presence. That or the monks had reached enlightenment, and such attachments were long severed within them. I wasn't really gonna figure out which. I'm sorry to say this, but nothing shall come from thy fair words, Magus. Well, that was surprising for me at the time. She wasn't angry. From there, I started counting my blessings. Who knew when my luck would run out? There, I decided to set my newspaper aside. I was groomed and wearing a shirt and a vest, so I had no problem with looking her straight in the eye, and those eyes were equal parts of wrathful intent and melancholy. Right. Enough small talk. You came here in the open. You used no shape-shifting and no hypnosis of any sort, didn't you? You were observed, getting a feel for their reaction to your mere presence trotting through the city, weren't you? She looked at me like I grew a second head, so I decided to continue. Don't be so surprised. Since I woke up from near death, I had been reading on the legends surrounding you. My little comment on the marks of Atioch should have given it away. There was a pang of guilt there. Not obvious, but it was there. I decided to continue to press on. Princess, who are you looking for that you feel the need to use your presence as bait? I was going for the jugular here. Those who dare to use the nightmare, those who dare to bring such a monster back from the dark, and as a result, made us remember and gaze at our deeds at such a horrid creature. She said, practically yelling at me. I, I may have gone too far, but I needed to know that we were on the same page. We know that this may be too much of a task to labor for the monster that nearly killed thee and hath left thee to rot. But we ask of thee, as thy princess, we ask thee with purpose and conviction to plunge into the abyss, learn their names, and find those vermin. For steel is the only justice we have, and the only justice we shall give. She said, this time with a somber tone. The sort of tone that runs a chill up your spine, and its certainty and impact, much like a declaration of war. I trotted away from the front desk, and looked at the ceiling. I was contemplating what she said, thinking on my next move. Well, you are not Nightmare Moon. You are a hostage that I failed to set free, and for that, I'm sorry. My failure is inexcusable, I said, to let my thoughts be known. I could feel her eyes at the back of my head, her will practically radiating from her very core, and I continued. But, if you need a monster to be at your beck and call, I will be that monster. I will help carry you that burden, and we will use our blood, treasure, and skill, not for glory, but for revenge. That is something that you must be comfortable with, if you consider this lowly sorcerer worthy of the task. And from there, I brought the papers as we sealed our contract in blood. And that, your highness, is your answer. Chapter 14, Alliances in Blue Blood Hunting. Back to the present. 
The room was silent like a graveyard, my words sounding like the distant thunder of a coming storm giving them a thousand promises of madness and calamity. I had just confessed to making a blood oath to a mission of vengeance. Not only was it something greatly frowned upon, but also, I had done so with a figure from a legend who also happened to be the younger sibling of Princess Celestia. This was the kind of confession that would get you jailed, and I waited for Celestia's answer. It didn't really take long for her to say something, but waiting for it was torturous. It was like being in a guillotine while the executioner was deciding whether or not to do his job that day. I thought that all of the ponies involved during the summoning were used as material to create Nightmare Moon's new body. How could the ones responsible still be out there? Celestia said, surprised that it was her sister that demanded such a thing. Because Luna knows. Princess, she saw it all, and I was there as well. That scar on the right side of my chest, just underneath the fur, should tell you that I was there. I saw the face of the stallion that willingly led his brethren to the slaughter. The one that wore the sonorat around his neck, and he is known to all of you as Arpeggio Philharmonic. And that did it. The room turned cold. The sounds of the civil service bureaucrats milling about their business with their assigned tasks turned into a complete absence of sound. Every eye in the room stared at me as if I had declared that the world was flat and the moon was made out of cheese. Celestia then looked to the civil service telepaths and saw with surprise that all of them were crying. They were all silent, but the tears in their eyes were unmistakable. And I felt a pang of guilt for them, having to channel my emotions during that time. Having to channel that grief that I feel every time I stare at Sonorad. The memories of the deaths of my friends, how the world feels incomplete without them, and how their sacrifice gave the world a bit more time. How they stopped something long forgotten and buried from making its way back into the world. A world that has long forgotten its presence. A world that cannot even begin to fathom what lies buried in the depths of the earth and time, and all that is claimed that world in the absence shall perish in the resurgence. A foundation of bones for the reconstruction of the First Empire, and a feast of souls for the First Tyrant. Trust me when I say that in comparison, Nightmare Moon would have been seen as a saint. I did my best to hide it every day. I couldn't afford to let it out. I had to bottle it up, keep it from coming to the surface, and bring attention to myself, but to empathic telepaths? They might as well have been there themselves. They weren't sobbing, nor were they bawling. They were looking to the ceiling with their eyes staring into something far beyond their sight, their mouths agape in horror, and their tears still running down their cheeks. I felt terrible. Had I had time to build up my usual mental barriers, they wouldn't have had to see it. I was having a hard time keeping the mask of aloofness on myself, but somehow I managed to keep it on. Witnessing this with surprise and worry, Princess Celestia said the following. Folklore, can you tell me what just happened? I replied in kind. The memories regarding Nightmare Moon summoning are connected to my memories regarding the deaths of Savage. Wrench, and yep, uh, Princess, considering that it was the same group that was responsible for both, it's possible that your telepath stumbled into the latter rather than the former. Even while saying that, I noticed that my body was slightly shaking at my own thoughts on the experience. I picked up my tea and took a sip from it. The shaking of my right forehoof causing some of it to spill on my fur, I barely noticed though, considering that I was too distracted with my own memories festering in my mind like an infection. Celestia herself, though, was looking at me with a genuine look of pity. This should have not been a surprise. She already knew what happened and she helped us cover up the incident, after all, and not to mention that she was really fond of Wrench. Not many can say that they were in a romantic relationship with a demigoddess, but Wrench could. Not that he ever did, only a self-absorbed jerk would kiss and tell. How is it that I know, though? Sorry, but... Have you met me? All it took was me seeing them in the same room together to figure it out. And as I was having rather nostalgic thoughts on one of my deceased friends, Celestia decided to acquire my attention once more. Folklore, are you trying to tell me that Dr. Reanimator is still alive? I waited for a moment to gather my answer. This was a sensitive subject after all. Your Highness, I killed him. I ripped open his chest cavity, 
shoved a grenade next to his heart, and threw him into the horde of monstrosities below. I saw the scatter of fire, crimson blood, flesh, bone fragments, and the shredded remains of entrails. I saw as the abominations that had long been trapped in the derelict remains of the First Empire being reduced to a similar reddish paste of alagmalated body arts and pain. I even saw as more creatures swarmed in and feasted on both the Reanimator and their brethren alike in a savage frenzy of bloodthirst and ravenous madness. I said it was a... sensitive subject. Not that I was going to redact from what occurred, though considering the colorful detail that I used to describe how I did it, I should have expected what would happen next. Dotted line in the Royal Guards took a step back. The rest had a look of obvious anxiety, one Pegasus secretary reaching for the knife she kept under her desk, and interestingly enough, Celestia remained calm, and the telepaths were slowly recovering from their shock, which is something that actually brought a bit of relief to me. I already had enough crap that I was ashamed of, I didn't need to add mentality crippling seven innocent mares to the list. Though, Dotted Line had a few choices of words. You just confess to murder lore. Not to mention vigilante activity and possession of illegal weapons even by the standards of your hunter license. He then turned to Celestia, wearing a pleading expression on his face. Princess, I beg of you to at the, at the very least send this mad pony to an asylum. It would be a mercy compared to the execution that would await him if we didn't take into account his special circumstances. By special circumstances, he meant self-defense and a possible end of the world scenario. Celestia then spoke. It was actually a surprise to me that she would show me mercy. I thought that she would let me finish the case and then send me to Granite Grind Prison off the coast of Los Fieres in Western Equestria. But she said next, well that was a really surprising part. Don't bother lying. He and the rest of Dr. Savage's aides were in the Hollow Earth with Savage himself. They were beyond any international treaty or equestrian law to begin with. Not to mention that Reanimator's crimes ranged from unscrupulous experimentation to murder, rape, and cannibalism. Even if the reanimator hadn't already mutated himself into some kind of monstrosity, he was hardly a pony to begin with, more like another monster wearing equine skin. After she was done, she looked at me straight in the eye. Please, folklore, continue. I regained my composure and did as I was told. Thank you. As I was saying, the probability that he is still around are almost none, but the reason that I was hospitalized here last night was because I was dealing with his work on magic, and something that defies reason. A creature that is neither a spirit, a fae, nor a demon, yet has abilities and weaknesses from the previous three. I'm keeping it sealed in a whiskey bottle that I placed in a rune-reinforced iron box in Uncle Archive's closet. It may indicate something worse is on the horizon. And Princess, not to mention that Madame Octavius Cello was radiating something equally menacing. There are things that have been living in the shadows with nothing but dust to sustain them. They want their world back and we cannot do anything to stop them. The Last Merlin, Star Swirl of Celtica. <laughs>